Greetings and salutations. My name is Vernon Youngblood. I am an anarchist, and that's pretty much the only thing that you need to know about me. <laughs> but um, I guess the other thing you need to know is the timing, right? So I'm living in the midst of the most expensive election ever. And about two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I started seeing videos in my YouTube recommendation bar coming from other leftists talking about like voting for Biden, like, you know, like get off your high horse if you're not voting for Biden, it's harm reduction, all of these arguments. And I believe they're coming from a sector of YouTube that's called the scumbag left, <laughs> which, all right, you know, I'll give it that. The name made me laugh a little, but the videos themselves and the content creator made me really question like the foundations of the leftist propaganda that we're seeing on YouTube. It seems to me like the mentalities people are guided towards sometimes just replicate those of capitalist means of production and also capitalist frameworks of victories, at times even equating a liberal and elected office to a win in itself, which is like, whoa. Yeah, I guess it's just, it's that woe feeling that made me make this video and it also just feels really dishonest to the process of unlearning the harmful behaviors and frameworks that have been able to build up these regimes. And again, they're just not providing alternatives to the capitalist system, but building consensus now for a liberal regime. Another thing that I sometimes see in these like scumbag left to videos is like historical revisionism. Huge problem and I'll try to chew off a little piece of that today in this video. But also a lot of erasure, again with these arguments around harm reduction and erasing harm. And most importantly to me, a lot of uninformed propaganda being consumed by a lot of people and it's being framed as like yeah you know like this is helping people people are being more informed they're being guided more towards the left but again i'm wondering how it could possibly do so when they're just replicating these same like capitalist framework i feel like people deserve to know about the resources and texts that exist that can actually improve their understanding of how the state, through its many systems of domination, enacts violence on people, on the people, and especially indigenous people and descendants of American chattel slavery. So when you're dealing with an imperialist state, especially one of the size and scale of the United States, spreading half-truths like I feel like these channels do, often suits the state's narrative and equates to the harm of erasure in itself as well. So that's what I'm going to be talking about, what it means when the following arguments are made by the left in addition to addressing the arguments in themselves. Um, the dynamic between like the internet left and the state has been becoming like super interesting to me recently. So I look forward to diving into it. The first thing I wanted to say is that like 40 to 50% of the US electorate does not vote in the election, like every election cycle. And even if they did vote, it wouldn't fix the problems that are integral to the state, as in non-incidental, um, that arise because of the state's structure. So what are these problems, right? What can't an election fix? An election can't fix genocide, settler colonialism, imperialism, slavery, debt peonage, and order through repression. These are all things that arise because of the state's structure. So changing the candidate does not change the fact that these things must occur, but rather how visibly they're done. The second thing I'd like to say very clearly is that the militant left will probably not <laughs> sway the US election anytime soon. But who cares, right? And I feel like it's kind of wrong to ask people who are aware of the extent 
of the institutional violence at hand that is inevitable through both regimes to feign ignorance and soothe the fears of others who also feel that unconscious revolutionary spirit, which seems to be almost half the U.S. population who realize that their votes do not matter. Most who vote in the U.S. are whiter, more privileged. Workers and poorer people tend to have the lowest engagement numbers. So let's not trick those people into thinking a broken system will work if they just participate in it. Reduction through voting. Our society is built to invisibilize or normalize the domination of the oppressed, period. That is one of the primary functions that systems like racism and transphobia serve. In addition to that, we in the U.S. are purposefully kept from the majority of the consequences of our everyday actions and purchases. So when I hear people say voting is harm reduction, I ask how and for whom, because there are the issues innate in the state, and then there are the issues that will be normalized in both regimes. And especially in the act of voting, how is the act of voting in the U.S. electoral system anything other than a pipe dream to a politician? Because we actually don't live in a direct democracy, and we'll be getting to the electoral college later. But more to the point, it's always been the social movement that has moved the needle, moved legislation in a more ethical direction. And the reason I brought up historical revisionism before is because I feel as though one of the lines that continues to be propagated is that there is a necessary coalition between politician and social movement. And I actually do not believe that to be the case. Here are actually a few case studies from a piece called The Lure of Elections, released by Black Rose Rosa Negra Anarchist Federation. To illustrate that movements, not politicians, make change, it's useful to look at history. In the US, the major periods of political change came when social movements, including labor, Black liberation, feminist and ecological struggles, were at their peak. New Deal reforms of the 1930s came when workers were occupying factories and shutting down cities with general strikes. Civil rights and environmental protection bills came at the end of the 60s, when social movements were organizing for popular power and disrupting the ability of business and the government to operate. In periods without social movements, politicians fare much worse. Even those that authentically believe in creating a better world. In Atlanta, Georgia, in the 1980s, Andy Young, the chief strategist, legal counsel, and close friend of Martin Luther King Jr., ran for and won the city's mayoralty, a position he held for close to a decade. By that time, however, the strength of the civil rights movement had ebbed, leaving Young, a crusading reformer, in office without the power base to make change. According to scholar Clarence Stone, Young faced widespread opposition from the city's corporate business elite, preventing him from passing any meaningful reforms for the city's black population. Here, lone progressive candidates can do little without the backing of social movements. The phenomenon is true, even for far-left candidates, like Socialist Seattle City Council member Kashama Sawant. Her major reform, 15 Now, was watered down and transformed by business and business union interests who created major exemptions in the law, giving Sawant a victory she could run re-election campaign on, but not bringing meaningful change to working people in Seattle. To this day, many workers do not earn $15 an hour in Seattle because of employer exemptions. So despite all of this, it seems as though we still collectively quantify state harm by what makes news conglomerates capital, right? By the issues that reach us every day on social media, despite knowing that those platforms are manipulated. And doing all of this while looking towards a false past manufactured by the state to absolve itself of its debts to the people. So why? <laughs> Um, I believe this issue is twofold actually. One is that unlearning is hard, right? So realizing the aforementioned may take some work. The other is that 
when you vote, you are promised the platform that you are co-signing is to be followed through on, and therefore voting, if you perceive that promise at all valid, is an extremely effective use of your time. You're also able to use that vote to hold the politician accountable, right? <laughs> but as we laid it out earlier, it's actually not that simple. You mistake voting and electoral campaigns as effective propaganda or an efficient way to get our needs met. But this fixation on the short term or flimsily purported efficient single act is a problem in itself. Short term thought derived from capitalist modes of production, more and more and more. However, the real solution lies in pacing ourselves and building coalitions of workers in sustainable union structures, fighting for military and police abolition, and attending people's needs in a way that enables greater well-being for real communities. Those things are not small victories or time sinks, but real gains for people that last and that build a better world now. This is contrasted with the current system, which proves itself to be thoroughly unsustainable every day and also strictly requires a ruling class and a subjugated laborer class. Staying on topic does not make you more or less responsible for the actions of the ruling class, but repeating their lines, their own propaganda, to a newly radicalized audience misinforms them as it has misinformed many prior. And that is also a harm, and it's one that you become personally responsible for when you create that propaganda, looking for it to be consumed by masses of people. And those demanding for abolition now are simply tired of the charade, as they deserve to be. By repeating state lines as to their selfishness and naivety for not wanting to participate in a clearly broken system, you are undoing a lot of their work. I wanted to also quickly address the situationship the left broadly has with electoralism through third party candidates. In my opinion, I don't think they're worth their budget. It seems to me like they're a waste of time, resources, and propaganda, merely replacing a figurehead with another, even if inadvertently. The existence of the third party candidate is free promotion for the US electoral system. And there is some acknowledgement that the electoral system is broken, A, by their existence, and B, by their significant minority position in governance. But it's an acknowledgement that simultaneously bends to the system's will without necessity. I don't have a problem with voting for a third party candidate instead of the main two, I just don't think it's a strategy that works. As Lucy Parsons is very much known to say, never be deceived that the rich will allow you to vote away their wealth. <laughs> you know, and just putting out a candidate is a means that is antithetical to the ends we must seek. It's working within a system that we must abolish for our own safety. Lastly, we cannot discuss the U.S. electoral system without briefly discussing the Electoral College. One of the aspects of the Electoral College I wanted to highlight was the fact that it is clear proof of land accumulation, land control, as a means of social control. It's voter invalidation through land ownership. And it's the only way to protect the owners of stolen property, as they must be overvalued to account for their negative impact on the general public and erase the genocides of black and indigenous people. 